All right, y'all. Welcome to an introduction on plant communities. This is going to be my weird, super strange Wizard of Oz style uh, narration where I point the phone at the computer in some super amateur way. Y'all, I hate screen capture software. I have had some super frustrating things happen with it. So, this is how we're going to do it. But that's okay. I'm still here. And look, I can even wave at you and point at things on the screen. Wow. So, we're going to look at plant communities throughout the Piedmont Mountain regions. We'll start with, of course, our region and reach out to different plant communities or look into different plant communities throughout the mountain regions um, to kind of basically give you a brief highlight of each of the... I'm going to try not to knock this steady arm all over the place and make you guys nauseous like I do with the tours of these communities, but... Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of give you a brief overview of all the communities with the most predominant, easily identifiable species within each one that's indicative of that area that will allow you to kind of determine what area you're in first. This is kind of the only infographic I found that shows most of the areas or plant communities that you can find in your um Text, we see at the top of these mountains, we have things like grassy balds and heath balds where you get a lot of exposure. Um, so the grassy balds, those are prairie-like areas and the heath balds where we find um, a ton of plants in the Ericaceae family. And then, of course, we have some things that we see in the Piedmont area, kind of with their in their uh, mountainous versions like oak hickory forests or oak hickory pine forests. And... Um, even alluvial forests, and of course this <coughs> is this kind of ridiculously oversimplified, um, absolutely ideal version of a mountain that has all of these different communities represented. Now, some actually do. Up near the parkway, there are some of these ideal examples, but we can see we'll talk about acidic cove forests and high elevation red oak forests, and of course up near like the top of Mount Mitchell, um, or the highest elevations in North Carolina, we'll see these spruce fir forests and uh, talk about those. So when we look at the Piedmont region, we're talking about uh, right where we are, right here in kind of the central or left of central section of the state. And the mountains are, are a couple hours away from us. Hopefully most of you guys have been to the mountains. If you've not, um, a couple hours away from us, we start to see... Uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and we'll talk more about those because it's a section of the Appalachian Mountain Plateau, which is in North Carolina, but reaches much more south and all the way up into the northeastern section of the United States. And so the Piedmont is essentially between 200 and 1500 feet above sea level, really hot summers, very mild winters, only about uh, 50 inches of rain. This is less and we get a lot y'all in the winter time you've probably noticed it rains a lot in the winter here we have pretty mild winters for gardening purposes we're in zone eight uh a or b depending on what particular region of the city down south or more north that you are um where we only get a couple f hard freezes where the ground freezes a year sometimes we some winters we have none of those which is why we have mild winters and of course if you've been around here you know we have Extremely hot summers that break 100 degrees, oftentimes with high humidity. 50 inches of rain. Some areas in the mountains only get a similar amount. Asheville, for example. So, the mainstay in the story of Piedmont development has to do with Native Americans, who, of course, came to uh, America or immigrated through um what we think was uh, the Bering Strait when it had frozen over during a glacial period. About 12,000 years ago, we see uh, evidence of inhabitants and their early development in the U.S. Now, there's some question as to whether or not people also um, arrived on the coast, on the East Coast sometime around then as well, which were uh, from different places around the planet, right? Um which were the first Native American populations. Now, 
for our interests, how they impacted the forest is what matters. And what they used to do was institute and use regular forest fires. They would clear the understory of main forests using forest fires, and it would open up that, uh, that bottom layer, right? And it would increase the presence of those herbaceous plants, plants that are not typically woody or have wood in them. Uh, and, and grow a great deal in a single season. It's what we typically mean when we refer to herbaceous plants. Um, and a lot of herbaceous plants, things like blueberries and blackberries and so forth, were great sources of food, which is why they would burn and open up the understory of many forests. Now, based on archaeological evidence, our estimations for worldwide Native American or United States Native American populations uh, I think this is all of North America, actually. Somewhere in the range of a couple million Native Americans were here, but after Columbus arrived in the 1500s, something like 95% decrease in populations uh, by about the 1800s from that 1500s to the 1800s. So in a couple hundred years, uh, or a few hundred years, we wiped out most of the Native American population because Europeans, of course, brought over uh, diseases that would infect native populations and they had no immunity built up to them, okay? So when we look at the 1700s and 1800s in the early Piedmont region of North Carolina, here's the Robinson House out by uh, Reedy Creek. This is a site that you can go see. Reedy Creek is just a, a nature preserve um, a couple miles away from campus. It's an amazing, really, really cool place to go. Uh, if and when it is open, and you can go see this Robinson house, and it is a house that existed in the early 1700s, which is crazy to think about Charlotte having history uh, that early on. So in the early 1700s, we have uh, basically European settlers move up river as far as possible into the state, and Really, the Piedmont is about as far as you can go before you have significant elevation change um, into the mountainous regions, although they did head up that way as well. It was just trickier. And of course, if you know anything about the, the history of the South, basically a lot of people were, were building cotton and tobacco mills, which used hydropower to power um, a lot of different moving parts that would either spin cotton or grind tobacco. That means, obviously, that our main staple crops during that time were cotton and tobacco as well. And these monocultures are terrible for the soil and, in fact, destroy the uppermost layer of the soil and increase its infertility, um, which obviously is bad. Another thing that, that was terrible unbeknownst to us in the early 1900s was this huge campaign from Smokey the Bear to prevent forest fires because as it turns out, more than half the plants in the Southeast United States actually need regular and controlled uh, forest fire burning, obviously controlled so that it minimizes human impact. But back in the day when that really wasn't important, more than half the species in the Southeast need fire uh, for regenerative purposes, which is why some trees like oaks and pines and so forth have extremely thick barks And in fact a lot of pine cones won't even open until they So as we move on from history to sorry, I just hit this This little phone holder thing as we move on from the history into the individual communities, it's important to factor in attributes of those communities and essentially why they're specific communities to begin with. Why do we find specific types of plant assemblages in certain areas? And of course, there's a million different, well, there's a few different key factors that go into what types of plants will prefer a particular area. And those, of course, include climate, which is weather over long periods of time, um, changes in elevation and water availability, which is largely dependent upon topography or the layout of the land. Of course, the geology um, and the soil structure. Many plants cannot thrive in uh, soil that's hard pan clay, which is um, just tiny soil particles, for example. Uh, you can see that, I, I don't know how much you guys have had or learned about soil in general, but soil is comprised of sand, silt, and clay, and uh, sand are the largest particles and clay are the smallest, and of course, tiny particles all stuck together. 
Uh, North Carolina is well known for having uh, a lot of clay or in uh, soil structure categories, we call this ultisol. And it's hard for roots to push their way through hard clay and it's hard uh, for them to not rot if it stays waterlogged for long periods of time because it doesn't have a great deal of aeration. Whereas up in the mountains, we have these perfect mixtures of silts and clays and sands. Um, if you get this perfect mixture, sometimes we call it a loam. And uh, how these soils form to begin with is dependent upon the bedrock it sits upon, right? Sometimes we'll have a granite or um, sometimes we'll have uh, limestone, which is very calcium rich. And this will change the overall acidity or pH of the soil to begin with and largely affect the soil structure. And these things are all, all extremely important for uh, comprising or making the soil structure to begin with. And this uh, controls what kinds of plants can thrive. Some plants need rich, well aerated, light and fluffy soil. Some few things can survive on hard, tough clay, but we'll see very specific plant assemblages gather there uh, to try and outcompete other plants that can't that that kind of need the perfect balance of ingredients. A uh, disturbance is extremely important, of course, at high elevations. You have things like acid rain, wind exposure, heavy snows. At low elevation, we have different things to contend with. Um, uh, water runoff from pollutants and so forth that are extremely important in urbanized areas like where we're at. Uh, of course, regular fire, whether or not it, it, it has been uh, a, a feature of that plant community in the past, whether or not we're continuing to use it through proper conservation practice. And of course, conservation in general, really, really important. Some areas are very niche specific. Um, bogs, for example, there are not many of them because you need a lot of different variables to form a bog. Uh, grassy balds are another really good example. These are prairie remnants of ancient times when there were giant megafauna like mammoths and so forth still roaming around. Um, and so they're slowly uh, undergoing succession. And in order for us to maintain them, we have to uh, do specific things like, you know, make sure and keep them clear of certain species and minimize in, in, invasive outsiders and so forth. So all these really, really important features. We see this little creature in the background right here. This is the balsam woolly adelgid, uh, which is a, a European transport that's come over to nearly eliminate the Fraser fir population in the Fraser fir forests at, at, high, at high elevations. Um, and this is a common problem. Insects come from outside and uh, almost completely eliminate or wipe out uh, huge uh, tracks of a particular species, and it can be disastrous for that particular community. So if we look at our first uh, community in a Piedmont region, these are kind of on the edge between Piedmont and mountain habitats, and so they have a, a blending of both. We typically find river bluffs on north-facing slopes. Now, you may have not thought of this, but north-facing slopes, because in the northern hemisphere, because of the Earth's tilt, are essentially tilting away. You know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, hopefully. And because of the Earth's tilt, the northern hemisphere has that north-facing section kind of tilted back a little bit. And so north-facing slopes essentially have the least amount of light exposure. And so you, you end up with this, especially in a steep elevation, you end up with this kind of microclimate with increased uh, humidity. And it allows species uh, like rhododendrons or um, the Ericaceae family uh, to thrive in that area. And you don't see other areas in the Piedmont with uh, rhododendrons. And in fact, many of our own rhododendrons on campus, which are some 60, 70 years old, are beginning to uh, fade thanks to um, climate change and this average increasing temperature, which they cannot handle. Uh, River bluffs have acidic soil, which is another place these evergreens can thrive because evergreens grow slower. It's more energetically taxing, but it allows them to thrive in soils that are not ideal for other species. 
This is also a reason why we find, because of the steepness of these slopes and kind of the inhospitable nature of them, we haven't really developed river bluffs a lot. So oftentimes we'll find old growth trees. You can see this shiny silvery bark of American beech, which we'll see throughout a lot of different areas. And this is euonymus or a strawberry bush is also indicative of river bluffs, though you'll also find it in oak hickory forests and so forth, and even some mesic forests but this is the most uh, similar to mountain region. Now, when we look at alluvial forests, we're thinking of areas uh, most commonly in, in this area next to the greenways, because greenways are built in usually flood zones because the land cannot be used for other things. So oftentimes this is where we'll find alluvial forests. Uh, these are areas with high mineral deposition because the water runoff constantly floods and redeposits all of those new fresh minerals from the water into the soil. It's kind of like having a constant source of natural fertilizer. They are, however, low oxygen environments because sometimes for prolonged periods of time, you can end up with um, saturated soils that are, of course, not as aerated as others. And... Uh, we see some of the more common species in this area. This right here is a, a Rudinaria gi gigantia. I'm not gonna tax you guys with the uh, genus and species. Let's just stick to the common names for, for the plant community purposes. Uh, this is a giant river cane. This is American sycamore. You see this mottled peeling bark. This bark right here is uh, either hackberry or sugarberry. This one right here, sugar, uh, hackberry, sugarberry has is a little less warty, though uh, you've really got to have the leaf side by side with the bark side by side to be able to determine the difference. Most of them are hackberries, however. You will see lots of these down in the, um, along the greenway towards the, uh, towards the creek side. You also see here we've got uh, more shrubra, whoops, uh, mulberry, and uh, mulberry is another common tree that you'll find in these floodplain areas. Now these areas can be impacted not only by flooding but uh, also by um, creature, uh, also by various creatures like beavers and so forth which can kind of fell these trees and dam up some of these sites and actually in turn can eventually uh, lead to the formation of boggy areas, which can allow this certain specialized species that thrive on those swampy type boggy areas, uh, or marshes, as we call them sometimes, where we have slight movement of water, uh, can form in these alluvial forests. And of course, they can also, uh, once these beavers, uh, dens and so forth have, have been eventually break down and they undergo a couple different generational changes and perhaps move out of a different area, the restoration of that water movement can also occur. So there's kind of this flux between the slow moving and fast moving water based on the, the outside influence of beaver activity. And it kind of, y'all, it might sound ridiculous to talk about beavers, uh, but guess what? There's a ton of them. Particularly in Reedy Creek, there's a bunch of beavers you can walk down to the end uh, behind the Nature Center trail at some point in your life and see that there's a bunch of uh, trees that are cut down with teeth marks, and that's a telltale sign of beaver activity. So also in the Piedmont, we have basic music forests. Kind of the dead giveaways here are when we see things like uh, Umbrella Magnolia, or any of these big leaf magnolias. Also, we have some of those on campus. You likely won't see them elsewhere, but umbrella magnolias, you can see in music forest. Definitely a dead giveaway if you see anything like anything like that. There'll also be pawpaw, which we have here. Pawpaw have weird burgundy dark uh, red flowers that are fertilized by flies, though you won't see them that often because they're only, um, they're only open for a couple weeks in early spring, and so I just wanted to show you a picture of how you'd see a pawpaw most most often. Kind of looking like the magnolia leaves, though the way that they arrange themselves on the stem is more uh, side to side rather than in this world formation. We have uh, pink azalea, or pinkster azalea, which is common along uh, creeks and music environments. So music just means wet, right? Or, or uh, a moist area. And we also have sugar maple oftentimes in these areas, as well as other things that you see less commonly like service berry and so forth. But uh, once again, I just chose the most common dead giveaways 
for you to know that you are in that particular environment. We will see pawpaw elsewhere, right? You can see pawpaw in the alluvial forest. You can see pawpaw elsewhere in um, in wet areas of even uh, in bottomlands of oak hickory forests even. But what you're looking for is no one species is ever a giveaway of that particular area most of the time. Sometimes it is, but usually you, you got to remember a couple of these key uh, species in conjunction with one another. And we use trees because they're largest and easiest to keep track of uh, to know what particular plant community you're in. Now, because of moisture availability, these, these forests usually have a rich herbaceous layer and have the widest range of biodiversity in the Piedmont area and usually have a mixed canopy of various species uh, like tulip poplar and these um, magnolias and so forth. So basic music forest, pretty rare in the P Piedmont area, but close to campus, Reedy Creek has got some music forests in it. And the most common here, we have oak hickory pine. In the very background of this particular slide, you can see uh, what's called running cedar, which is a type of uh, um, lycophyte, which is a club moss. And really cool because there's not many representatives of this group of plants, but you can find it. And as soon as you find it, it you know you're in a pretty established uh, oak hickory forest, sometimes called oak hickory pine, because there's also a mixture of pine and a lot of oak hickory forest. But here we're talking about a dry community with, without much water availability. Of course, since it's called oak hickory pine, it's mostly oaks, uh, but also plenty of hickories and pines. I'm trying to figure out, I have a whole video on how to identify pines. Easiest way is to look at needle length in conjunction with the uh, shape and size of the pine cones, the female cones specifically. Uh, this, the smallest cones around here are short leaf pine and uh, the needles, however, are a little bit longer than the Virginia pine, which have larger cones. So once again, it's important to keep track. And if you don't, if you're out and about and you're like, oh, I can't figure out what kind of pine tree this is, just keep, pick up a couple old needles that have died and fell down beside it. Maybe you can find some old, old cones and bring them home with you, unless you just happen to be carrying a ruler around with you. Same goes for hickories. Uh, most of the hickories in our area are either mocker nut, bitter nut, or shag bark. Shag bark's the easiest to identify because it has extremely shaggy bark. And if you're looking at compound hickory leaves, which you'll see in one of many videos that I'll post for you, uh, you know you're looking at a hickory tree. But um, there's some differences in uh, mocker nut and bitter nut. And mocker nut, we've got karyotomatosa. Tomatos just means hairy, if you can recall. Uh, and so you can feel the texture of leaves to figure out the differences between some of the hickories as well. If you cannot find nuts or if you've got multiple species beside one another where, you, where you're like, which, which tree did this come from, you know? So oaks, as I mentioned before, and pines and so forth, all these have extremely thick barks and are used to and benefit from the uh, regular burning of a particular area and they need fire for regeneration like i mentioned before some pine cones don't even open when we're looking to try and figure out most uh oaks you guys when you're looking at oak leaf identification uh you've got smooth rounded edges for the white oaks and then you've got big wide flag shaped kind of leaves for red oaks right here the quercus rubris and looking at differences amongst those it can get really tricky You've got another really common oak around here is post oak, and there those those leaves kind of look like a like a plus shape. Um, and then chinkapin oaks, where you've got your oaks that look like chinkapins, so it can it can be tricky. But most of your oaks are going to be white or red. Now, when we look at xeric hardpan forests, in the background we've got a persimmon tree, diasporus, which is a genus meaning fruit of the gods, which is kind of hilarious if you've ever eaten a. Persimmon, it probably was that when it, uh, back in the day when it was one of the only fruits you could come across. I've got a couple gigantic ones of these in the forest behind my house. Um, they're weird. They taste kind of like a prune. Sometimes they're extremely seedy. Sometimes they're not that seedy at all. Better for making jam or drying the fruit out. But kind of a uh, really glaucous or shiny leaf kind of a giveaway. Um, and typically you find you can find these on very poor soils. Here we've got blackjack oak right here. Uh, leaves pretty much only look like that. 
and not many things can can thrive in areas with uh, just thin clay soil with bedrock not too deep beneath it. And you'll find this on upland sites. We'll talk about upland and bottom one sites here in a little bit. But basically, we're talking about the tops of hills and the bottoms of hills, essentially, which make a big difference in what kinds of things can live there. At the top of the hill, the rain's falling down from it, so these are really dry areas. They're usually undergoing a great deal of erosion because of constant exposure and rain. This right here is called microstegium, which is an invasive um, called Japanese stilt grass that you'll see in, in, in woodland areas like oak hickory forests and zero card pan areas. So a lot of times after a construction clearance, you'll also see persimmons and blackjack oaks kind of moving in because it's one of the few things that can thrive uh, if the soil is super, super poor. If it's not too bad, then you'll see, you know, your typical succession where you've got uh, the movement towards an oak hickory forest if it's a dry area and so forth. Now, here's some examples of what upland versus bottomland means. Um, in upland ecosystems, we've got the tops of uh, any type of elevation. And it can usually mean some type of plateau at the top of that elevation. Whereas down at the bottom, at the bottomland, we've got areas where the water runs down towards. And uh, that increased water availability changes what kinds of species can thrive there. Right here, we've also got, we've got upland species, and then we've got bottomland right here, where we've got particular, very, very specific species that can thrive. And in this uh, example, you can see, if you've got a slope in the bottomland, down towards the bottom, you have the, the most amount of seepage and water collection. And so you have sometimes swamp areas forming right in there and species that really thrive in those particular areas. Sycamores really like bottomland, um, right in those little swampy areas towards the bottom there. Now we've also got granite outcrops where uh, there, there are a few of these, some of these out towards, uh, out towards the edge of the county. For example, you can find just little rock outcroppings in areas where you'll have just giant boulders sitting uh, either on a forest edge or in the middle of a forest. They have very shallow soil, obviously, because it's mostly rocks. We see lichens and mosses in these particular areas. Lichens, a symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae. Very specifically, it's two fungi species and one al algal species. Um, very desert-like. Huge fluctuations in temperature as the rock heats up and cools off at nighttime. Uh, a lot of times you see winter annuals here. Annuals versus perennials is kind of a confusing concept. Annuals only live one year and then die off and then go on to the next generation by reseeding, whereas perennials continue to grow and develop year after year and usually live anywhere from, whatever, 5 to 12 years for most common herbaceous plants. Um, they do set seed once they reach a flowering maturity age at around 2 or 3 years old for perennials. But a lot of times we'll see winter annuals. A lot of the weeds we see in our yards are winter annuals. If you notice all these crazy weeds popping up over the winter, which maybe you haven't before, but after you have field botany, that's all you'll notice. <laughs> um, there's winter annuals everywhere. They set seed. They're not alive in the in the once it gets really hot in the summer, and then throughout the as soon as it gets warm, like maybe February, all these weeds start popping up, and. So plants trying to survive in these granite outcrop areas will, will capitalize on that and uh, only essentially live or grow and throughout their reproductive cycle during the win winter months when there's not these huge temperature fluctuations. You'll also see succulenty plants or plants that have these thick stems, uh, things like purslane and so forth that uh, have the ability to store water for prolonged periods of time as it gets really, really hot and dry during the summer months. Roadside. This is what you'll see mostly driving around. Uh, in the background, we've got uh, goldenrod, which is one of the most common wildflower, weedy wildflowers that you'll see establishing itself on roadsides and so forth. You'll see in some videos that I post that... Uh, There's also a great deal of what we call dog fennel, which kind of looks like a uh, goldenrod, but not with the, the pretty golden colors. Uh, a lot of variation depending on what kind of soil and bedrock and depth and moisture availability that's kind of hitting that exposed roadside. What's kind of hilarious is that 
it's actually ideal. Power line right-of-ways and roadsides are kind of the only remnants we have of our early prairies because most of those habitats have either undergone succession or been used for development. And we had early prairies. There's one left in North Carolina called Soothers Prairie. Um, where you see these very rare wildflowers that only thrive in prairie-like environments. This is Schweinz's uh, sunflower over here. Uh, I know it looks just like many other wildflowers, but um, it's actually different. This is, <laughs> this is Schweinz's sunflower. The only place you, you can find this sunflower, y'all, is within uh, 60 miles of Charlotte, North Carolina, in the planet. It's got some specific... Uh, morphologies that are unique to that particular species and genetically it's also extremely unique. If you ever are driving by some way, somewhere in like Cabarrus or Union County and you see a sign that says like, you know, no pesticide use or uh, do not mow, then usually there's some rare wildflowers growing there. Here's Eastern Bacchus or, or salt bush, which you commonly see blooming in the fall uh, on, on roadways, which is, uh, these are all these these are not necessarily invasive um, in their origin, but invasive in their habit. This is invasive in its origin, this uh, Albizia, which is commonly referred to as mimosa tree. Uh, it, it, it is in the Fabaceae family, despite its weird flower morphology. Most of the Fabaceae family has that, that, that very specific flower morphology. This one doesn't have it. It does have the compound leaves though, and it does fix nitrogen, meaning it can invade anywhere, improve the soil conditions, and kind of outcompete those native trees. Um, so roadside areas. I've got some video breakdowns on some roadside areas that, that you'll look at, but some of the more common ones maybe have these species in it, maybe do not have these species in it. If you, if you check out your own roadside example, there's a lot of variation. And, and what they have, especially during throughout the season. Next, we're gonna cover mountains and the ancient mountain area. But first, I've got a capstone meeting for one of my honor students. So I'll tune back in a little bit. All right, next we have the mountains or mountain region. <laughs> Try to get this steady arm from stop shaking. So. The Appalachians are ancient, ancient mountains, some of the oldest in the world, probably around 500 million years, which is absolutely insane. Um, in fact, what's really cool is we also have some of the first land plants and trees in their uh, most preserved forms here on the um, East Coast up in New York. We have huge uh, ancient fossil forests in a place called Gilboa, which is a quarry that's been um, opened up and refilled and then reopened. And we have these ancient remnants of these trees called Clouded Zolopsids. Uh, you can see the simulated forest picture of what were um, probably what our first forests were probably like, which is really, really cool. There's n there's hardly any places on the planet that have fully intact forest fossils where um, paleobotanists can kind of walk around and get a lay of the land and then develop simulations and analyze these, these fossil trees. And a lot of these, Cladozolopsis specifically gave rise to ferns and horsetails. And uh, ferns, there are large ferns. I know when I say the word ferns, you're probably thinking, what, what the heck, how did these giant trees give rise to the little ferns I'm familiar with? There are tree ferns, um, and there are ancient, ancient ferns were, were mostly gigantic. So very, very cool ancient mountains. So when we look very specifically at the Appalachian Mountains, mostly we're focusing on what we call the Blue Ridge Escarpment, which is split into um, the Northern and Southern Blue Ridge Escar Escarpment here which is just this ridge that runs up from the mountainous regions a couple hours away from here. Uh, towns you may have heard of that are associated with the Blue Ridge Escarpment are like Brevard is right here, right in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and then Hendersonville is a little bit right outside. 
uh, this escarpment, and then Asheville is also in this area. Waynesville, some of you may be familiar with. A lot of you know Lake Kiwi or Greenville even. But here we're looking at, uh, there's various uh, views along the Blue Ridge Parkway. You may have, you're probably at least vaguely familiar with the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is a road, a giant road that, that, that goes all along the ridges of the uh of the Blue Ridge Escarpment, and you can see very specific areas out here. Maybe you've heard of Looking Glass Rock, maybe you've heard of Black Mountain, um, maybe you've heard of some of these other areas. But just to kind of give you a layout of exactly what we're talking about, you can see right here we have the Blue Ridge Escarpment in relation to where the Piedmont is, and then the South Mountains. You can go visit South Mountain, which is the closest mountainous region uh, to where we are in Charlotte here. And you can see all the Blue Ridge Mountains. You can see the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and Nantahala, which are uh, on the other side of Brevard, North Carolina. So just trying to give you, give you a layout. These are very, very special, very, very old places. You get almost 100 inches of rain a year. You can see because most of that rain rains down on the mountains because of the directionality and the movement of cloud cover over those mountains, only about half of it, less, less than half of it ends up in Asheville. In fact, Asheville isn't much wetter than we are here in Charlotte, but it is extremely diverse because of these drastic elevation changes, these age the ages of these mountains and this huge shift in, in elevation, this this large elevation change. Um, so this combination has led to this huge diversity, about 2,500 species of plants, 1,500 in Great Smoky National Park alone, and the most of any other national park, which is one of the really cool claims to fame that we have in North Carolina. Also, we have more species of salamanders than anywhere else on the planet. Also, we have more biotechnology companies here, right? So the Europeans did move to the Piedmont in the 1700s, but also came up to the uh, the mountainous regions in the mid-1700s and 1800s. All this was originally Cherokee land, which you may or may not be familiar or vaguely familiar with that history, but of course we displaced the Cherokee. Uh, they had different names for the Blue Ridge Mountains, obviously. At the very top of these mountains, we have spruce fir forests, which are mainly comprised of Fraser fir and red spruce. This is above 5,000 feet. These are like boreal forests. If you can go all the way back to try and remember what we learned about forest types or different biomes when we were younger, maybe you remember the taiga, which is this frozen region above a, fir a certain elevation that we refer to as boreal forest. Um, oftentimes there's even an alpine zone or a zone that completely lack trees, though um, we don't have that zone up here. We do have grassy and heath balls, but we have trees that go all the way up because we only have 6,000 feet of elevation gain. gain. Um, the Vanderbilt Enterprise was built in the late 1800s and early 1900s by logging great swaths of this forest. And as I mentioned already, we had that woolly adelgid damage. Um, also known as the balsam woolly adelgid. Don't, com don't confuse this. There's also another insect called an aphid. Uh, I can't remember the detailed differences before that. We'd have to ask uh, Dr. Cal. I think aphids don't have an adult uh, flight-based form. I'm not totally certain. But anyways, that came over from Europe in the 1950s and wiped off m most of the fur population so that now there's mostly uh, spruce remaining. Another huge problem at these high elevations is we have air pollution and that air pollution of course is part of the water cycle and leads to acid rain and there's a huge area off the parkway that we refer to as um, graveyard fields where acid rain has destroyed a big chunk of, of this forest. We also have grassy balds, which are areas that are high elevations that are essentially just meadows, right? So we basically have a, a big lack of trees in these me meadow prairie-like areas. It's basically a prairie at elevation. This There's some um, theories as to how these things form, like how on earth do we have these blank areas? And a lot of it has to do with Ice Age climate change, where we've had glacial movement, eliminate how they remained prairies and did not undergo succession is likely due to megafauna grazing. Like I said before, there were mastodons and there were giant ground sloths, which are my favorite animal to think about existing. And there were uh, even elk and bison in these areas uh, 
up until not too long ago, actually, okay? Sometimes these are shrub balds because they'll, they'll actually have shrubs here. Here we can see uh, this is yellow-eyed Susan or black-eyed Susan, rather, which is a common uh, plant that you'll see in grassy balds. This I put on here because this plant's going to go extinct. This is Gray's Lily, and it is on the verge of extinction. Absolutely beautiful uh, plant in the Liliaceae family with those six tepals. Um, only grows on Roan Mountain, which is on the Blue Ridge Escarpment, and uh, having a hard time coping, coping with climate change. This is called Angelica. You can recognize it, or Mountain Angelica. Recognize it by that umbel uh, inflorescence. And of course, these areas typically would undergo succession without some kind of control or maintenance. Because they're such a unique niche, there's a wide range of diverse flora found in these areas. There's a ton of grasses and sedges that we only find in these areas as well. And uh, we're doing our best to protect them as a result of these unique flora that we find in these areas. Now, heath balds are similar, except for there's obviously acidic or poor soil here where only these evergreen uh, plants in the Ericaceae family like rhododendrons and mountain laurels and uh, azaleas. These are flame azaleas. This is mountain normal, laurel calmia. This is uh, rhododendron major. And these are all common heath shrubs that you'll find in these heath balds where there's basically a thin layer of acidic soil and bedrock uh, a little deep to that. It's not quite as exposed as a rock outcrop that we'll see here in a little bit. Uh, may have been previously forested and simply undergoing succession where heath shrubs can survive. And of course that evergreen trade-off is that these, these plants grow very slow because they have to grow thick leathery uh, foliage that is evergreen, is very energy intensive, and as a result of that, uh, and the fact that, uh, as a result of that, they can thrive in these nutrient poor environments. Now, with rock outcrops, this is areas where we have bare rock, right? Obviously, we see more lichen species thriving. We have uh, rock and hair cap moss in these particular areas. You'll even see some other rarer plants. Um, these areas eventually will trap soil and that's when you'll have a, enough buildup of a few inches of soil that you'll see some trees start to move in along the edges of these rock outcrops. And rock outcrops in the mountainous regions are usually above 3,000 feet. Oftentimes there's these rare plants that are alpine species remnants from um, early on throughout evolutionary history when, when they were thriving essentially at uh, lower or higher um, elevations depending on what the temperature or climate was for a particular area in a mountainous region uh, throughout geologic time and now essentially are, are just thriving in the microclimates of these rock outcrops. So high elevation red oak forests, well these are exactly as they sound, mostly comprised of a canopy that's primarily red oak, that's what red oak looks like, bristled tips on those uh, leaves and um, on those parted leaves. We also see tulip poplar. This is tulip poplar in bloom, though you would only see that a couple weeks out of the year in spring. And here we've also got some birch, which we also see in these particular areas. Uh, prior to the 1930s, when chestnut blight was introduced, uh, which is a fungus that's spread by an insect that infects the uh, vascular cambium, underneath the bark of American chestnuts. Most, y'all, there were something like 99% of American chestnuts have been eliminated. These were these giant monstrous trees historically that were largely found in red oak forests and now red oak forests are thriving in this particular area. So this is about 3,500 to 5,500 above sea level. And if you go back to our infographic on, on how these are spread out, you can see that these are some high elevation areas. Now, there are some differences between red oaks and white oak. Red oaks uh, take three summers for their acorns to mature once they drop them. And then on that third summer, they have to overwinter or stratify before they will, uh, before they will germinate. 
they're a little more intermittent, in other words, with their fruiting habits and uh, not as reliable for their acorns, for scavengers like small mammals and so forth. Whereas it only takes, for white oaks, it's only two summers and it doesn't require, um, I think they germinate on that second summer. It doesn't require, the white oak acorns don't require overwintering. So just some uh, differences between reds and white oaks. We also have northern hardwoods. And this is usually higher than about 4,000 feet above sea level. We have those north facing slopes, remember, that are a little cooler. We have the formation of microclimates, usually higher humidities, which is already high in the mountains because of the high rainfall, which is why we consider the mountains of North Carolina a temperate rainforest. We have a large temperature fluctuation, but a great amount of rain. If you have a northern hardwood forest that's above about 4,500 feet, we call this a beach gap because the, the canopies formed primarily from old beech trees, and this is beech. Uh, good way to spot beech leaves, kind of since they kind of look like your quintessential leaf, is that they're on the, the, the trees through the winter. They, they die and they, they hang out on the limbs through the entire winter. I have some video of that somewhere, I'm sure. We've got mountain bee balm right here, which is a, in the Monarda genus. Uh, this is a mint, it's in the mint family. It's got those opposite leaves in the Lamiaceae. And a uh, really good indicator that you're in a northern hardwood forest. Here in the back, we've got some birch. You can see the peely bark of that birch tree. And then we've got uh, sugar maple down here in the bottom right. All good species in combination that are indicative of that northern hardwood forest. Uh, conservation concerns for these areas is that they're full of wild boar, which can be disastrous because they eat everything, all of the plant seedlings, you guys, you name it, all of the berries, uh, they can be, they can do huge damage to biodiversity in a particular region, which is why they have a pretty wide open hunting season on wild boar. They were introduced from Europe. They are not native here, but there are thousands of them. Rich Cove. This is the most biodiverse mountainous region. Uh, this is under 4,000 feet, thousands of species. Here we have a pink lady slipper. Uh, usually a canopy comprised primarily of tulip poplar. These are ramps, which you may have heard of because these are in the Alimer onion family and are eaten. They are delicious and they are used in a lot of southern dishes that are kind of like old roots, old style southern dishes. Here we've got some pawpaw, just another example or a picture of what those leaves typically look like and all good indicators uh, of um, being in a rich cove forest, but there are a million different types in these particular areas that you find. If you ever see lady slippers though, you can pretty much guarantee you're in an area that's extremely rich. What separates a rich cove from an acidic cove is that it has a calcium rock base like limestone or marble, which actually keeps the pH of the soil closer to neutral or even a little more basic. Whereas in acidic cove forests, we don't see this high biodiversity because we have acidic soils because the bedrock is like quartzite or granite or something like that. We'll still see, we'll see more of a mixed canopy in acidic cove forests, though still a great deal of tulip poplar. Um, and that's what this is, tulip poplar. And up here we have these red maples, which are also really common in acidic cove forests. Kind of some dead giveaways here in acidic cove forests. Rhododendron species, heath species, Ericaceae in general. Um, and speaking of which, here's one of the members. It's a dead giveaway that you're in acidic cove forest. And this is called uh, Mountain Dog Hobble. So named because people used to hunt uh, wild boar and so forth throughout the mountains and bear. And they said that the bear would just tear through this uh, dog hobble no problem but their hunting dogs would be incapacitated trying to run through it this is only about three feet tall by the way but it grows in these huge colonies that are kind of hard to run through hard to run through the dense forests of an acidic cove forest in general because of the presence of all of these heath shrubs spray cliff environments uh brevard north carolina or transylvania county in general is uh claim claim to fame is that it has more waterfalls per square mile than anywhere else in the u.s so thousands of waterfalls. If you ever want to go to the mountains and visit somewhere, some waterfall, you can go even the busiest time of the year and, and you want to just hang out with you, your family, or your friends, let me know. I know tons of places. Uh, this constant supply of consistent uh, moisture and consistent microclimate means that there's an extremely high 
level of biodiversity, especially amongst mosses, which of course need constant uh, levels of moisture. There's something like close to 300 species along four miles of the Whitewater River, which kind of runs up close to Western, you guys, if, you, if you're familiar with Western Carolina. Uh, we can see this is, um, this is a thalictrum that likes to grow, a ruined enemy uh, that you'll see uh, commonly in these spray cliff areas. Here in the back is, is also a very unique um, member to spray cliff communities. And this is shoestring fern, which is really neat and remarkable because it only has a uh, sporified form. It's infertile. Uh, and... It's, it's probably a remnant of some uh, tropical species because remember, geologic time, different areas around the world have experienced different types of climates, drastically different. And there was some tropical um, climates millions and millions of years ago in these areas. And so the shoestring fern probably can only live out one stage of its life cycle due to the um, environmental constraints of wide range temperature fluctuations that we currently experience in these particular areas. So pretty, pretty cool, crazy environments, spray cliffs. There are of course lots of streams leading to these waterfalls and alongside them is a consistent area that floods typically. And you have these streamside environments here. We have, this is ironweed. Um, this, is a, this is a river weed that grows throughout under the water in the river. Uh, here we have, um, th there's a lot of wide range of sedges and grasses and so forth in these areas as well. And uh, royal catch fly down there in the um, bottom right that we see in rocky streamside environments as well. So lots of neat things living beside. These ironweed, by the way, also grows as a really common prairie plant. But... Seeds deposited in the river float downstream, deposit along the, the riverside further on down. Here we have these bog environments. Uh, bogs are few and far between. They're much more common in northern Appalachians where we have these bottomlands being formed more often. Um, so not super close to us in the mountains here, a little further north and the northeast uh, up uh, along further uh, along that Blue Ridge escarpment. But here we'll have tons of, of ferns. We have ferns here on campus that we can show you uh, these things that you wouldn't typically see. This is cinnamon fern with these cinnamon uh, fertile fronds. And then we have an erupted fern where the fertile fronds are interrupting halfway along that rachis. And then here is a tree species that you will see in oak hickory forest, but uh, also love swampy areas and that's black tupelo. This is skunk cabbage in the background of the slide here. And we do have some skunk cabbage in the Van Laningham Glen on campus as well. Though you will only typically find it in swampy areas. So there are forest bogs. We also have cataract bogs where there's just a short, there's a shallow soil sitting on top of granite. Uh, like we've mentioned before already, beavers can greatly impact any forested area that are largely dependent upon water activities and having consistently moist soils. In boggy areas, that moist soil is just sitting there permanently and consistently wet. And we have very, uh, ex we have very, um, there are very, there are a few very rare species that are dependent upon bog environments like our, uh, Venus flytraps and pitcher plants that are native and endemic to North Carolina. Although most of the species in bog environments you can find elsewhere and it's because they're just adapted generalists in a particular, uh, for a particular species. There are chestnut oak forests where we have chestnut oak and this is what chestnut looks like, but this is what chestnut oak looks like, right? So American chestnut, we also talked about. There are a few remnants. There are a few that are more white resistant uh, that we can still find. We also find scarlet oak and chestnut oak forests. And we also find sassafras. Sassafras, you can, you can see some of these on campus. And what's also really cool about sassafras is the roots were used. Y'all, 
in Jamestown, original American settlement, sassafras was worth its weight in gold, basically, because they used to use it as a panacea or a cure-all, where they'd boil the roots and use it to drink a tea that's supposed to heal you for this and that and whatnot. It was also used as the first flavoring for root beer. And if you, if you dig up sassafras and cut up the roots, which you should not do, unless you have a whole stand in your backyard or something, um, and boil it, the tea does just taste like uncarbonated root beer, especially if you add a little sugar to it. So chestnut oak, now we're getting into low elevation, um, drier areas. They need fire maintenance. As I mentioned before, it used to be most American chestnut before the chestnut blight came through in the early 1900s. And, and the understory is similar to an acidic cove where we will see plenty of rhododendron species in these areas as well. Now, pine oak heats. So this is where we have very low diversity, strong presence of rhododendron, species here just another shot of what they look like here we've got some virginia pines with these twisted um two needle bundles that we can commonly see also the yellowish nature to those uh needles we'll also see some scarlet oaks here as well pine oak yeast are also home to our native wildflower i'm oh, sorry i keep hitting this thing our native wildflower which is carolina lily which looks like a lot of other lilies but trust me it's not it only has a single stem and a single bloom and it is absolutely beautiful and mesmerizing to see in nature because it's extremely rare. Uh, these areas are very dry. And of course, once again, we need that fire maintenance. Pines in this area, the only real threat is the pine beetle that comes through and, and destroys a large number of pines on kind of a decade by decade basis. Every 10 years or so, the pine beetle population will kind of surge and kill a, a great number of pine trees. Now near the forest edge, this is where we have lots of vines. Uh, here we have Virginia creeper. We've got lots of loblolly pine right here thriving. We've got some black-eyed Susans along here. We've got some sweet gums. Sweet gums you'll always see getting first established because there's a gajillion seeds in here. Uh, getting first established in roadsides that have been cleared or fields that have been cleared for construction that maybe did not begin construction immediately or uh, quickly enough. It's also filled with exotic invasives like those albizia or those mimosa trees. Um, and, and these are, these are areas where you would see lots of invasive species. Eastern backers or saltbush are really common along forest edges as well. And you'll see a lot of a wide range of species here. Uh, vines can be classified based on their clinging behavior, right? So you can have some hooked vines like multiflora rose, which is a type of, um, which is a, a, an invasive rose type. You also have some vines that cling which they have these, uh, basically they have root-like projections, which are basically roots uh, that attach to the to the tree or substrate that they're trying to climb up. Uh, English ivy, which is a common invasive that people plant in their yard and just takes over their yard like a jungle. Um, poison ivy also does this which it kind of roots to trees. That's why you hear this saying, raggy rope, don't be a dope. If you see something that looks like that, giant poison ivy vines. There's also vines with tendrils like we have with our um, Virginia creeper over here that is just growing up like that. And then we have twining vines like uh, invasive wisteria, which are this beautiful purple blossom blooms you'll see in forest edges and so forth that are just kind of growing themselves up. But there's a lot of exposure and they can kind of get themselves to a high enough uh, vertical height in the forest canopy to, to thrive right along those forest edges. Boom. Mountains and Piedmont. Hello, everyone.